Graham Close, welcome to the Pace Performance Podcast. It's a pleasure to have you. Ah, it's wonderful to be here. I'm even back, Rob, so thank you very much. Yeah, no, thank you very much. So you joined Hannah and James in a recent roundtable on nutrition. I found it fascinating, which is why I pestered you straight away after that to try to get you on and uh, and get you on the podcast and have a little uh, dig deeper into some of those topics, some of which are supplements, CBD, um, and immune health. So anyone doesn't know who you are, Graham, would you mind just giving us, there's a lot going on to this, I'm going to have, have to cut you short, but you've got a lot going on, but would you mind just giving us a background on you? Yeah, so originally I was trying to be an athlete myself. Back in the mid-90s, I was trying to be a professional rugby league player. Uh, I had one season playing at Warrington Wolves in the, in the mid-90s, and then, as a lot of people did, through a lack of talent and combination of many factors, worked my way down the divisions, And I retired from rugby pretty young at about 22 uh, and then embarked upon a second career. So I went to university, studied sports science, got to meet Professor Don McLaren, who at the time was a real pioneer. That Not only was he a professor, but he was an applied sport nutritionist working with Bolton Wanderers at the time. Uh, It really motivated me to say, this is quite exciting. So I continued to do a PhD in sport nutrition with Don and tried to model my career on him, very much so of being a a university researcher, which is my day job, you know, where my work at the moment is very much focused around some of the micronutrients, vitamin D, most recently cannabidiol, uh, on muscle function, muscle regeneration, uh, muscle soreness. Um, So I do a lot of research in that, but... The second part of my life is I'm a a sport nutrition consultant like Don was. So I currently head up nutrition for England Rugby. I head up nutrition for the DP World Tour Golf. Uh, I'm currently consulting to Aston Villa, working with boxing and pretty much everywhere really. So a combination of an academic and an applied practitioner, I would say, is the short answer. Nice. When I had James Moorhead on the podcast, I can't remember, maybe a year ago, we were talking about the increase, uh, and the, the increased numbers of nutritionists who have full time jobs in clubs, it, not just a, like it maybe was five, ten years ago, one day, one day a month, and you turn up, and you know what, what kind of impact can you have on one day a month was kind of James's argument. But is that continued to develop, and there's yes, more full time so. positions? Yeah, my first ever role was with Munster Rugby, or my first major professional role, and that started off as one day a month, exactly what you're talking about. And I quickly realised that that wasn't enough, so that changed to me doing more like one day a week, and then I realised that wasn't enough. Um, And so I I removed myself and I put in Warren Bradley, who became full-time at Munster Rugby, and Munster's a great example of a team that since that day has always had full-time nutrition support now that myself and Warren have left and and I think Irish rugby's really led the way in a lot of this thanks to the likes of Ruth Wood Martin at the national team but all the provinces have full-time support and they've really benefited from that I think and and I'm seeing that now in in many sports teams I think the majority of Premier League football clubs now have full-time support uh, there's a growing number of elite rugby union clubs do, and I think they all would if the budget allowed it. Um, and I'd like to think that Liverpool John Moores, where I'm based, has really helped to contribute to this because the likes of James Mohen, who you said, came through our master's degree that myself and James Morton wrote six or seven years ago. Uh, and since then, we've graduated about 140 really talented young people with a master's degree in sport nutrition. And the footprint of M140 is phenomenal. If we look through um, elite football, rugby, within the EIS, all over elite sport, there's loads of our JMU graduates. So, yeah, it, it's a it's a growing industry, a growing discipline, and one that I, I can only see getting even bigger in the coming years. Absolutely, and, and rightly so. So you wouldn't have a strength and conditioning coach in for one day a week or one day a month. So that's <laughs> yeah. always... That's always the argument, I suppose. But, right, supplements. This, and like I said to you in the round table, because we had a little bit of a discussion on supplements, this topic was born out of watching your UKCA presentation about what we can trust, what we can't trust. And it, when you ask that question, the numbers of supplements 
slowly shrink um, in terms of what we can trust from the research, but what actually works and things like that. So I'm going to put it to you straight away. Supplements, what can we actually, what can we trust? Yeah, trust is a, is a big word. And I guess we need to come at it from two angles. We've got the trust that there's actually any evidence that it works and it's not just a marketing scam. Uh, and you only need to go into any supplement shop and you see thousands of things which we can probably get down to four or five that maybe work. So you've got the, the trust from, um, is it effective or is it just taking well-earned money out of your pocket? And then the second side, particularly when you work with elite athletes like I do, it's can we trust it from a terms of a, an anti-doping perspective? So I'll deal with the second one first because that's, that's pretty much been covered by a growing number of these third-party companies who do batch testing. So what we know is that traditionally, if you was to buy a supplement off the internet, one in 10 would contain enough prohibited substances to fail an anti-doping test. One in 10. No, I think that's frightening. One in 10 is what the studies suggest. You literally are playing Russian roulette with your career. And even if you're not a professional athlete, and I'm thinking like if you're a parent of a, a teenager who suddenly decided that they want to try to creatine, for example, which has got proven efficacy. They may not be drug tested as an athlete, but would they want their supplements contaminated with something that could fail a drug test? Because bear in mind, it's not just athletes who are drug tested, but certain industries, police force, the, the military, for example. So it is a real genuine risk that poor manufacturing can result in, in supplement contamination. So there's now a number of third-party testing organisations, such as Inform Sport, such as uh, NSF, the Cologne List, um, the BSCG, the Banned Substance Control Group. And these are organisations where a supplement company can register with. And that will mean that by the time you buy it as a consumer, that has been independently tested to check if it's got anything prohibited within the that could result in an anti-doping rule violation. It's important to stress that that's risk minimization, not risk removal, because these companies can't possibly test for absolutely everything. But, but if you ever look at the wider list, it's stupidly complex, stupidly wrong, uh, long, uh, and causes more confusion than it should do, in my opinion. But the test for the major things. So, and, and as far as I know, if we take Inform Sport, for example... There's never been a product sold on the informed sport list that has subsequently been proven to be contaminated. So it's a massively reduced risk from the one in 10 of buying it over the internet. Uh, and the good thing is now there's a growing number of companies who register the products. So there's no longer any excuse, I don't think, for anyone not to get access to a, a batch-tested supplement. So we can definitely remove that type of risk, Rob, if, from that side of things. If you want me to then think about the second side of it, which is the risk of uh, wasting your money, there's many products on the Informed Sport list that are useless. So remember, Informed Sport isn't a kite mark of quality. And, and I've had this discussion with the likes of Informed Sport before. that it's, For me, it's a kite mark that it's been batch tested for safety. But there's still some absolute nonsense on there. You will still find batch-tested fat burners. And, and as we know, if fat burners worked, the world wouldn't have an obesity problem. You know, the research is pretty clear now that if there is any increased thermogenesis, so increased help with fat loss from a fat burner, you would burn more fat walking to the shop to buy it than what you actually would do by taking it. It's so minimal if there's anything but it's really pointless. Uh, and there's lots of things like that. So I try and simplify the supplements down to just, you know, half a dozen maybe of things that are really proven and have got evidence. And recently the IOC published a, um, a position stand on supplements uh, and they outline quite clearly the ones where there are proven evidence. And there's another really good resource on the Australian Institute of Sport website where they uh, categorise supplements in terms of a hierarchy of evidence. So you, you've got a real 
good independent way of looking at it. And it leaves us with a few things like protein if we need a bit of extra. Creatine is pretty well studied, as I've mentioned. Beta alanine is pretty well studied as a buffer. And then things like vitamin D if you're deficient. Uh, and, and one or two others. But really, there aren't that many. Just going back to the informed in sport, is they're obviously, like you say, a kite mark that it's batch tested. Is it just a sec- just a secondary um, like position that people have kind of adopted with informed in sport that it is quality? Because that's obviously not their aim. In terms of when I say quality, I mean it actually works. So there's that confusion there. Do they do anything to say that we're not this? Or do they kind of just take it in as, you know, it's boosting the informed in sport brand and what they're about? Yeah, I think people have taken it a little bit of if they say an informed sport, it must be good. And I've had this discussion with informed sport in the past, you know, because of some of the wording. So sometimes I've seen on their social media, you know, uh, where it's been, you know, look for the informed sport to guarantee credible products. And I'm like, that's not really what we're saying. You know, what you're looking for is look for the informed sport logo to guarantee tested products. And I think they have changed the wording quite a bit. I really like them as a brand and they're good to speak to. Uh, and they are they will listen um, and take on board constructive criticism. So this isn't a criticism whatsoever of them. Uh, but I do think people do interpret it that way. Uh, and unfortunately... I think we do should start by looking there, but we also need the sport nutritionist to come in now and help the athlete identify the product that's suitable for them in their unique situation as well. Because let's take, for example, beta alanine, where there is loads of evidence that it can help buffering. If your sport doesn't need a buffer, then it's a waste of a time product. You know, So not only do we need to look at the evidence, but we need to look at the evidence within the context that you're trying to uh, get the benefit from you mentioned vitamin d and that was something that I, I probed a little bit on in the round table especially for for us in the uk is that something that you would give as a as a staple to athletes or would you test for that for deficiencies and things look in an ideal world we would test for it for a deficiency um and these days you can do finger prick testing for vitamin d um and and it's pretty um pretty good it's been validated against HPLC, which is the, the gold standard. You know, we, we, we like to see it tested using tandem mass spectrometry uh, rather than the colorimetric assays. But yeah, the finger pricks can be pretty good. One of the downsides, though, is I don't think we're fully convinced yet what we should be testing for. So normally what you would test for is 25 hydroxyvitamin D, 25 OHD. So if you went to the doctors and had a blood test for vitamin D, you'd get your 25-OHD measured. 25-OHD is then converted to its active compound, 125-OHD, and this is the one that's biologically active and, and, and has all its effects. But there's numerous reasons why we don't measure that. We measure 25 instead. One of the problems that we're becoming aware of is that there may be different requirements for different ethnicities. So we know that darker-skinned athletes have lower vitamin D, uh, because the um, melanin acts as a natural sunblock and it stops some of the conversion within the skin. And furrow skinned people like myself, you count me in. <laughs> dare I say yourself, Rob, uh, more susceptible to sunburn. Um, if we was to check our vitamin D, would probably be higher because it, we're generating it that little bit faster. However, there's evidence to suggest that that doesn't necessarily mean that they're deficient. And what we might need to redo is redefine deficiency based on ethnicity. And we're nowhere near there yet. There's arguments that we should be looking at the bioavailable fraction. So a bit like the testosterone and free testosterone, how much of vitamin D isn't bound to vitamin D binding protein and albumin. And that could be affected by ethnicities, as could the sensitivity of vitamin D to bind to a vitamin D receptor could be affected by different ethnicities. So that's a problem when we're blood testing, that we come up with one number that we want to apply to a whole range of people. To simplify it, what you could do if you live in the UK is once we start 
to stop synthesizing vitamin D. So once the sun begins to disappear, and that's the vast majority of the year in the UK, we've basically got no for a couple of months and then it's gone again, hasn't it? Um, so for the other nine months of the year, we could just take a low dose supplement. So when I say low dose, I mean about 2000 international units. Uh, 4,000 has been set at the safe upper limit. Uh, 2,000 is substantially higher than the R&I on it, the recommended nutrient intake, but it will correct the deficiency in the winter months. There's no evidence whatsoever of any harm, and 2,000 IUs a day is probably going to cost you less than 20 or 30 pounds to get you through the entire winter period. You've guaranteed that you've not got that deficiency, you've not overloaded and it saves the complexity of blood testing. I don't want to drag this down to a, a level where everyone's listening and thinking this is getting uncomfortable, but the benefits of that, the benefits of supplementation to keep vitamin D at a, at a healthy level, what are the what are benefits we're getting? Or athletes getting as well? Yeah, yeah, numerous. So the first thing is, like a lot of vitamin... Um, supplementation type research we need to massively differentiate between somebody who is sufficient being supplemented and looking for a, a boost and someone who's deficient and correcting and fixing a problem so if you're sufficient in vitamin d there isn't any real great evidence that supplementation will help but what we do know is in the winter months a lot of people become deficient so we're not looking now at mega dosing we know that if you're, defic if you're sufficient and you give more, it doesn't help. But we're correcting a deficiency. Uh, and research from our lab at John Moores has shown that you correct that deficiency, it improves muscle regeneration, which is something I'm really interested in. So we did a classic DOMS-type study where you uh, induce muscle damage. And what we found in was a, a faster recovery, uh, reduced soreness, but also in a cell model, we also showed mechanistically that the muscle regenerates uh, faster and better. So that's one aspect of it. If you're very deficient, it can affect overall muscle function, so even contractile ability. Uh, work from Mike Gleason has shown that your immune system can be compromised. So the very deficient, uh, we're more likely to get an upper respiratory tract infection. Um, so, so there's a, a variety of benefits for the athlete but I, I would say the two key ones is keeping well but you know supporting the immune system and helping us to recover from damaging Perfect. exercise and like we mentioned in the um in the round table good for coaches sports scientists those that even those that are out on the pitch especially those who are based in the gym probably you know 365 days a year not see any sunlight whatsoever, or sat in an office like you and I right now, coaches need to be looking after their own health as well, and this is an easy way they can do it, and cheap way they can do it. Correct. Uh, and I think that's one reason why, you said cheap at the end, why it's probably still not marketed as much as it would be if it was an expensive product. You know, you, you are basically only talking 20 or £30 pounds that will get you throughout the entire winter period. Um, so it's not probably been pushed as much as maybe it would have been if there was a lot of money to be made here. And you're exactly right. One of the things that you know I've enjoyed doing within England rugby, and, and John Clark has been a big uh, um, campaigner within our camp of this, is making sure that we do look after the wider staff. So we do try and help with uh, nutrition, help with, with the support staff, the coaches, the medical team. Because the more that the, the wider support staff are healthy, the more chance we've got of being um, being the at the the energy levels we want for our players, don't we? One other area that you mentioned that you were diving into more and more CBD. Um, <laughs> we just, again we discussed on the round table, but I'd love to dive into just as much detail and more and a few uh, offshoot questions as well. So everyone will be aware of it, whether you get pushed it on Facebook, you get pushed it on Instagram, Twitter, whatever it may be, or just coming up in conversations and in the press. What is CBD, first off? Yeah. So you're right, it's something that I've moved into. Um, this started about seven years ago when one of the athletes within England Rugby asked me about it. And at the time, I struggled to spell CBD, never mind know it. 
Um, but it was an easy conversation because at the time it was prohibited by WADA. So the conversation went, I'm not really sure what it is, but a quick WADA search says it's prohibited, leave it alone. And then come forward a few years, WADA in their wisdom, and if you could see the irony in my eyes, you'll see why the way I'm saying this, have decided to remove CBD from the prohibited list. So CBD is cannabidiol. It's one of the cannabinoids, uh, which are components within the cannabis plant that have um, some physiological effect. So you get the cannabis plant and it's got all these can cannabinoids within it. The two major ones that people may have heard of is THC, tetrahydrocannabinol, which is the, the psychotropic component. So that's mainly found in the marijuana type strains of the plant. It can be as high as 40% in some of these marijuana strains and is a reason why you get the illicit high off of consuming marijuana. Of all the other cannab cannabinoids within the plant, one that is now becoming really talked about is cannabidiol, CBD, because there are no psychotropic effects, so it's not giving you any of that high or anything like that. And there has been a number of reported physiological benefits of CBD. And then when WADA decided to remove it, um, with these suggested physiological and health benefits, well, then athletes are a, a clear target population to try and um, uh, approach to, to grow the popularity of this. Now, my reading of the literature is, is one of cautious excitement. Um, and what I mean by that is, I think there's enough evidence that this needs research and it could be game-changing in many ways. I listened to a podcast with Andy Jones, often known as Andy Beetroot in the sport nutrition world, who changed his Twitter name to Beetroot. Uh, and Andy said that he only intended doing one study on Beetroot, and that was 15 years ago. Still going. And he's still <laughs> working in Beetroot. I, I can see my close nutrition becoming close CBD one day, because I only intended to do one study, in it, and I can see the rest of my academic career being in it. So, yeah, I think there's excitement, but I said cautious excitement. And the reason why I exert cautious is the current WADA wording has thrown us all under a bus. And why do I say that? Well, they've removed CBD, but have left all other cannabinoids prohibited. So the chances of isolating from the cannabis plant the CBD without traces of any other cannabinoid is absolutely negligible. So some companies are coming along now and certifying the product as 0% THC, the psych major psychotropic cannabinoid, which is great. It won't be 0%, but it'll be near enough zero that the chances are you should be okay from a, an anti-doping perspective. Uh, interesting with THC, they've classified that as a threshold compound, which means you can have a little bit, up to 180 nanograms per mil in your urine, but no more. But... None of these companies are saying, as far as I can see, 0% of any of the other cannabinoids. And all the other cannabinoids, according to the wider wording, they're not even a threshold compound. So any trace amount of these. And when you ask for a certificate of analysis on the products, you will see that there are other cannabinoids in there, such as CBG, CBD, CBV. So lots of these other cannabinoids. Technically, just by taking that, you've admitted a doping offence. Because remember, the doping offence isn't testing positive. It's taking it. So until WADA changed the wording, and I think the wording needs to be to name the cannabinoids that are prohibited, rather than name the one that's allowed, I just think it's too risky for an athlete. And when I've tried to find out from WADA, are they testing for all the other cannabinoids? The only response I've got is, we could do. So it doesn't really help me. So an athlete could take a CBD product with 0% THC, and in theory, WADA could decide to check for one of some of the other cannabinoids, be find a presence, and we've been thrown a, uh, a sanction. I personally think, Rob, the answer is going to be, I reckon within the next two or three years, WADA will have removed cannabis in okay, completely from it. the prohibited list. Okay. Right. The, the NBA have gone down that, the UFC have gone down that route, and because 
the multi, multi-million dollar industry that CBD is now, the pressure that's going to be put for to remove it, to allow it to be taken, is going to be that big. I, I can see them caving and removing cannabis. You could also say, why is cannabis banned? It's not performance enhancing. I've never known anyone before the 100 metres at the Olympics, I know what I'll do, I'll have a quick joint. Or, you know, before yeah. a rugby game, for example. And actually, I'll play rugby against somebody. I think I prefer <laughs> yeah, them. Absolutely. You know, by the way. I mean, yeah. so let them take it. Oh, by the way, I'm joking here, by the way. But do you know what I mean? I, I can't... I don't think there's a real clear rationale for why cannabis should be prohibited anyway. Um, so that's what I think the answer is. So why would be. do you think they haven't gone down the route of THC with the other cannabinoids? In terms of um, letting, letting a certain because, amount in the system. Yeah, I think partly because then they would, they would have to then start testing for all these, I, I guess. And, and you... A word of drugs test is very expensive anyway. And you throw another 140 compounds in there. And bear in mind, there'll be compounds within the cannabis plant that we've not even identified yet. Um, and that's, again, what makes it even more complicated because we don't even know what's in there. Um, so what they have done is, without seeking advice, I would say, from experts in the, in the cannabis field, decided to just name CBD as being removed but without giving it enough thought of to what are the practical implications of this and the practical logistical implications of just created a minefield for athletes. Mm. So what, what research is out there at the minute from you, the guys that you work with, but anyone else? From a athletic perspective, there's one paper that says it doesn't help uh, from muscle recovery, and that's it. Now, that one paper was a short-term um dosage it was in non-athletes but it wasn't a particularly damaging so protocol there was lots of caveats around it but it was only one paper so the evidence base from an athletic perspective we, we can basically say it's non it's non-existent we're trying to fill that at the moment so i've got so many studies going on in my labs at the moment um one the obvious one we're doing is giving non-tested athletes as high a dose as we can be allowed to in the UK um, for a prolonged period of time to see what's happening with the other minor cannabinoids. Are they appearing in blood and urine and her from an anti-doping perspective? Um, we're looking at it from a performance perspective. So if it is masking pain, which is one of the suggestions where it may help, could it be advantageous in, let's say, you know, a cycling protocol, which is dictated by how long can you hang in there in pain. Um, we're doing some really neat, uh, with Scott Gillum, my PhD student, uh, pain studies where we're infusing hypertonic saline to induce pain within the anterior tibialis and seeing if um, how, how it handles pain. And then we're doing various stimuli on top of that. So we're, we're trying to answer the questions that I want to know as, a, as an athlete. But if you go to the main literature away from sport well there is evidence that it can help with pain management there is evidence that it can help with uh, like muscle regeneration there's even evidence that it can help with traumatic brain injury or so concussion you know again it, it studies on rats but you preload rats with cbd and then induce uh, a traumatic brain injury give them a cognitive task the rats that were preloaded with cbd we're able to function better in the task and then but won't. So even potentially protective. Now, if that's the case, we all know how, how problematic concussion could be in contact sports. Um, if there's a potential therapeutic strategy that may help, well then, I, I think we it's it's our job as credible sports scientists to explore this. 100%. So even, even just... Yes, taking the research into account, but just your intuition. Is there anything else where it do you think it could have potential? Yeah, the the other massive area is sleep. And again, the, the evidence in athletes isn't there. And when I'm saying it's not there, I don't want anyone to judge then but say, well, you know, that that's poor. You've got to remember it's been under prohibition for many years, and then it's been prohibited in sport. So it isn't something that has sports scientists we would have put any time into researching because 
it, it, it's banned and you can't use it. But now these restrictions have been lifted, having said that, it's still hard from ethics perspectives and lots of areas to do. So there's many challenges to doing research. But sleep seems to be one whereby there is potential. And we know that athletes compared to the general public struggle with sleep. When you look at the meta-analysis on sleep away from athletes in the general population, it would appear that if the reason for the lack of sleep or the poor sleep is anxiety related, then it may actually be beneficial from a sleep perspective. If it's for other reasons, it looks like it's going to be less uh, beneficial. But personally speaking, as an ex-athlete, it was anxiety that affected my sleep. Before games, you're nervous about games. And when you'd had shockers, like I had on a, a regular basis, after games, you replay the game in your head and you're, ang- you're worried about the, the review and what the coach is going to say to you the day after. So I, I think there's maybe potential there, um, which is why I keep going back to that cautiously excited. Uh, and we have got sleep studies as well uh, lined up. For those who are interested in CBD, there's the Lambert Initiative in a, out of the University of Sydney in Australia. And this is Mr. and Mrs. Uh, Lambert who donated a ridiculous amount of money to the University of Sydney to study cannabis. Uh, and this was based upon that the I think it's her granddaughter, Mr. and Mrs. Lambert's granddaughter, was one of these children who suffered from a rare form of epilepsy where you're having multiple seizures a day. And that's one place that, that, you know, it's been licensed as a drug now, Epidiolex, and it has dramatic effects at reducing these multiple epileptic seizures, life-changing for people who've got this condition. And because of that, Mr. and Mrs. Lambert donated a lot of money to the University of Sydney to set up a, a research institute for cannabinoids. So people like uh, Ian McGregor and uh, Danielle McCartney are doing some amazing work on CBD out of the Lambert you know, we're trying to, well, we are collaborating with them because without doubt they are the world leaders and they, they tweet some amazing stuff out of the Lambert. You know, they're doing stuff almost um, weekly on on cannabis and cannabinoids. So definitely a group to, to look at if interested in this field. How is it administered, Graham? Because anyone, anyone that says anything about cannabis, you just assume everyone smokes it. Obviously, that's not the case, but that's the image that you have in your head. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but with the CBD, the most common way are these tinctures, so little drops under the tongue. Um, that's what you'll see most of the time. You can get it in tablet form. You can vape it, but obviously I would never be recommending anything like that. Um, and know it's appearing in foods and gummies. And, and this is where the marketing gets carried away. I even saw CBD pizza uh, on sale. You know, So it's one of these where... It's going to be in anything. And an important thing is when we see it in drugs like Epidiolex, which is licensed to treat Dravet syndrome and things like that, you're looking at a huge dose, minimum of like 500 milligrams, if not up to like, you know, a thousand. When we um, see it in a, in the tinctures, well, the maximum dose we're allowed to administer in the UK is 75 milligrams. And when you see it in gummies and pizzas and that, there might be a couple of milligrams. So, uh, but then what, this is where, I, you know, people do things that I don't agree with. They will cite the type of Epidiolex research to promote a product that's got two milligrams in, but that's got 500 milligrams in. And, and then the other thing is when you're up at the 500 milligram mark, there is some evidence of some side effects like abnormal liver chemistries. Now, if you're suffering from Dravet syndrome and you're having multiple epileptic seizures a day, well, then the risk-benefit of some abnormal liver chemistries are probably worth considering. But if you're an athlete who struggles struggles with sleep, the risk-reward of abnormal liver chemistries probably isn't there. And this is where everything's context-specific, isn't it? So when we're looking at it, we need to look at dosage, we look at administration, we need to look at it in the right context. And the other thing to mention, if there are side effects, it appears be, to be uh, drug-drug related. So whereby the way that the enzyme that's responsible for metabolizing CBD is the same one that's responsible for most medications. 
So what you can, by taking high dose CBD, you can increase the side effects of other medications. So when, when you need to be aware of that if, if you're going to take it and you're taking other medication as well. So it's definitely one where I think professional advice is definitely needed prior to jumping so are you in still here. are you still getting athletes now you mentioned the athletes seven or eight years ago coming to you and asking you about it are you getting athletes on a regular basis asking about it is it something that they're getting yeah the marketing is catching them yeah okay all the time oh, wow. almost daily now we did a study a few years ago where we recruited about 500 rugby players to ask them have you taken it or have you previously taken it and despite at the time and i think still the case the vast majority of people urging caution because of what we've discussed 26 percent of these 500 had either taken it or were taking it so it, it, it is being used if an athlete asks me about it at the moment my advice is we just need to be cautious by what i've said the more difficult conversation rob is and i've had this one a couple of times and <laughs> don't ask me what I told them. I know I've said that. You're going to tell me. You're going to ask me at the end, aren't you? Um, it's where they come to you and they say, I was on tramadol daily for pain problems and I was spaced out and I was having serious side effects off tramadol. Someone suggested I tried CBD. I have done. I've come off tramadol. It's got my pain under control and I've been drug tested multiple times since and everything's fine. What should I do? And then there's me thinking, well, I've either got to put them back on a, a medication where there's serious side effects and we, we know that it's not healthy to be on long-term tramadol or say, yeah, continue taking it or find an alternate. And, and, and that's definitely the most difficult conversations I've had to have in this field. So... <laughs> <laughs> If you no, if you uh, and, the genuine answer, though, Rob, without giving anything away, is you give them all the information that I've just given you, yeah, and you say it's your call. I can't advise you, but this is all. Give them all the facts. Um, they know that the UCAD and WADA wording is a hundred percent me. So each athlete is a hundred percent responsible for what's in their body. Give them the information. Give them all the risks, and then let them make their own decision. Excellent. Super, super interesting. And I'm interested to see where it goes, of course, with everything that's going on research-wise as well. So immunity, boosting immune health. I think everyone in the last two years has become very aware of what they can do, not only just because of COVID. Well, yes, because of COVID, but how can I reduce the amount of colds? How can I reduce the amount of flu that are in the house, taking it to work and things we can do to protect each other? Now we've gone through that, we're coming out of the side. I think that, to a certain extent, will hopefully continue. But what can what place can nutrition have in helping us be able to do that? Yeah, brilliant question. And I'm going to get pedantic on terminology, if that's okay. Um, what I'm going to try and get us to use the terminology, if we can, and anyone who listens, please, from let's stop saying boosting immune health and let's talk about supporting it. Because what we can't do, as far as I've read, is do any, and we probably wouldn't want to, is heighten our immune, uh, baseline immune strength. Because, you know, the body's pretty good at doing that. But what we're able to do is the marketing's got me, Graham, on it. Need. The marketing's got uh, me with the terminology, the, the boosting. Uh, I've been. <laughs> correct. Yeah, correct. And, and that's what everyone talks about. You know, you know, and athletes ask me this all the time what can I take to boost my immune function? Uh, and I turn it around and say, there's probably nothing. But what we can do is get your nutrition right to support your immune system and give it all the tools it needs to operate effectively. Uh, and, you know, I'm very fortunate that at John Mills, I work with Neil Walsh, uh, who's one of the world leading exercise immunologists. And he wrote a great paper a few years ago. Uh, I think it was called A New Paradigm of Exercise Immunology. Uh, and in that paper, he starts off with fascinating uh, research and he, he talks about the, the seminal work of Leighton, and this was a work that was during the Second World War. And this was when the British and Russian soldiers who were captive were put into horrendous conditions and only fed eight, uh, 1,600 calories a day, something around that. But the British Red Cross were able to give the Brit British soldiers an extra 1,300 calories with an extra 45 grams of protein. And what they found was that the 
The risk of getting tuberculosis, or TB, was 1% in the British soldiers, compared with 19% in the Russian soldiers. So what we've known for many years is that nutrition plays a massive role in immune function. And what we're becoming more aware of now is undernutrition can actually be the major problem. And we're becoming even more aware that when I was being taught this, we, we thought it was carbohydrate, but it would appear that it's mainly now related to protein. And poor protein intake can actually immunocompromise us. So rather than talking boosting it, by getting our nutrition right, we can support the immune function. Now, this is really relevant because we're becoming very aware now, aren't we, of low energy availability in athletes. So this desire that athletes often have to get leaner and leaner and leaner, under-consume food, then get low energy availability, and now creating a host of problems, not just the well-recognized bone problems, but also we're now becoming really aware of uh, immune issues such as um, uh, you know picking up upper respiratory tract infections. And this is both from a macro perspective, so as I said, particularly protein, we know that we need rapid protein synthesis if we get a viral infection to deal with it, uh, but also from a micro, like the antioxidant defense, but also the micronutrients that are needed for cell proliferation, etc., and things like vitamin C, which is a key component of leukocytes, the white cells, but rapidly drops should you get a URTI. So it makes common sense that we give a little bit more of, more of that. So yeah, but there's a huge... Um, there's a huge role for nutrition in the immune system. The other bit of terminology I'd like to clarify is this massive difference that we're now aware of between um, immune resistance and immune tolerance. And what I mean by that, Rob, is for many years we've tried to study things that will stop us getting a URTI. Now, with the exception of malnutrition, I don't think there's anything that will boost an immune system as we've said, I'm not, I don't like that term, but you know what, you'll see where I'm going. I don't think there's anything that will boost an immune system to make us immune resistant. But what I do think, and so that's why there's been a load of failed studies. Let's give a load of this, and actually the, the, the rate isn't much different. But where there is evidence is this immune tolerance. And that, that is, if you do get like an upper respiratory tract infection, there are certain things that have been shown to reduce the severity and the duration of it. So vitamin D is a great example. Mike Gleason showed that those with the highest vitamin D had the lowest severity symptoms should they get the common cold and cleared it a lot faster. Similar, there's evidence like that on vitamin C. That, you know, if you can get about the four, 500 milligrams of vitamin C in, you might actually increase... The, the or decrease, sorry, the length of time you've got it. Um, so again, we're not stopping us getting it, but we're actually helping with the uh, the immune tolerance. Uh, and the, probably the latest one here is the zinc acetate research, where there's been a meta-analysis. Again, only on a few studies, but it's still it's still out there that sucking on zinc acetate uh, zinc acetate lozenges can have direct pharyngeal effects uh, and can reduce. The, the length of time that you've got that common cold. So in terms of terminology, I think if we can talk about supporting the immune system, and that's particularly with getting the, making sure we're not energy deplete, and then we can look at immunotolerance by, again, supporting the immune system should we get something. Now we've got some tools to help the athlete should they become a little bit ill. And if we think about that in the context of elite sport, you know, I could have an athlete who wakes up on a Monday morning in a World Cup final week who's got a little bit of a URTI. Normally takes a week to get rid of. But if we support the immune system with these immunotolerogenic um, compounds, we might be rid of it by Thursday and be going to a World Cup final ready to go. So whilst a two or three day reduction in symptoms might not seem important to the general public, in elite sport, yeah. that's On massive. the zinc lozenges, because I've got some downstairs in the cupboard, should that be, should they be taken as soon as that little tickle in the throat is felt straight on with them? That's the suggestion, Rob. Yeah, and now there's a few important things to point out here. Is that um, the chemical form of it is important, so it needs to be zinc acetate. 
And that's because when you suck on them in the mouth, because uh, it's not uh, tightly bound, the zinc and acetate dissociates and you can again get them direct um, in the oral pharyngeal region. The second thing is, the research suggests that it's 70 to 90 milligrams of elemental zinc. Now the lozenges are typically around about 10 milligrams, so you would need to suck on around 7 to 9 of them per day. So it's, it's almost like on the hour, every hour during the day. The third thing to point out is that that's well above R&I, which is down at around the 10 level. Um, so it's not something we would want to do prophylact prophylactically. It's not something we would want to do constantly. And it's not something we want to, to do over a prolonged period of time. We're just doing it to support during that, that time. But it isn't... I don't want any listener coming away thinking, right, I'm going to have 90 milligrams a day of elemental zinc. We do know that there are dangerous effects okay. of overdosing so on zinc. So for a short period of time, that's okay? So for the length of that yes. three to five days? Correct. Okay. The length of that cold, yeah, whether you've got the cold, hopefully three to five days that we can... Uh, and you know, and I've seen in, in applied practice benefits of this. Um, so the, the meta-analysis is... Uh, it, it started off um, the observation on... I think it was a young boy. It was a case study on a young boy years ago who... Uh, was going through chemotherapy and got um, uh, a, a viral illness and sucking on the zinc lozenges seemed to have a remarkable effect. And, and that's where the story started and it, it's continued um, and it's become quite an important tool that we can now have. It's one of these ones where I always have them in camp, whether it's with England Rugby or wherever, and I hope that at the end of each year I'm throwing a load away when the sell-by date's gone. No, but we always have them there just when you in mentioned case. the start of this this question around we thought it was carbohydrates that need to be um need to be up there when it comes to not boosting supporting immune health when you said it's actually we're thinking it's actually protein is does the source of protein matter when it comes to supporting immune health no, I, um, no, it, it's just making sure that we're not... Again, it goes back to what I said right early on about not being um, deficient. So, yeah, it, it's about making sure that we're well above that um, 0.8 um, grams per kg per day um, and making sure that we, we've got a regular supply of amino acids should we need them at the right time. But the other important thing on the immune side of things is there used to be this theory that athletes are more susceptible because of high training loads. And I think that's becoming a little bit quashed, to be honest, Rob. But we're becoming less convinced that a high training load does okay. make an athlete more susceptible. What does make an athlete more susceptible is things that would affect the general public but might affect athletes a little bit more. So long haul, haul travel has a massive effect on compromising the immune system. Poor sleep, less than seven hours a night's sleep has a massive effect on the immune system. Psychological stress has, has a huge impact. You know, we know that um, anxiety and psychological stress can have real um, immunocompromising effects. So these are reasons why athletes might get a few more common colds than the general public. But the only research that showed after prolonged exercise some markers of immunity were were reduced was probably we can put now down to an artifact of not the best techniques you know you know we might see a reduced number of white cells well they may just move mobilized and move somewhere it doesn't mean we got less or we're measuring one arm of the immune system and we've got to remember that the immune system works synergistically so if, if something's a bit, a little bit lower something might be a little bit higher and all these things work really well together. So I'm less convinced that the, the really hard training intensities make us immunocompromised. And, and I'm more and more convinced that it's underfueling, so low energy availability, combined with psychological stress. And if we can do something about them too, plus we just give the foods, we make sure we're not deficient in vitamins and minerals, so we're giving the immune system the support it needs then we're able, I think, to help the, the athlete reduce the chances of um, illnesses affecting performance. And the other thing to say is that we know that after injury, illness is the biggest reason 
why athletes have have time off. Um, so it is a really important thing. To, Interesting to try point. And help that last with. point. Like it. One thing that I asked you guys, Hannah, James, and yourself on the on the round table was debunking three common sports nutrition myths. I'm sure we could probably add a zero to the end of that three, just because there's so many potentially out there. But I'd like to bring that to this conversation as well. Have you got? It didn't have to be three; it could be one or two. It's absolutely fine. Sports nutrition myths. Well, yep. Well, I think absolutely. we've debunked one or two um, working our way through today. So it, we can boost the immune system. I think we can get rid of. We, we can support it. But anyone selling you a product that's going to boost it, I think we can be. I think we've debunked that any fat burner will have any effect. So we can put that one in there. I think. A good one to debunk is that the body can only digest 20 grams of protein. Absolutely, yeah. I, I don't know if you've ever heard that one. It, it always makes me smile, that one, because I just think, well, if your body can only digest 20 grams of protein, <laughs> where's the rest going? I, if you think, I, I'm just back from Lanzarote. I'm not that I'm showing off here, Rob. Uh, that's why I've got this glowing tan. <laughs> if anyone could see, they'd know that that uh, couldn't be further than the truth. But... Uh, one of the things I had in Lanzarote was an unbelievable mixed grill. Uh, there must have been 200, 250 grams of protein in that mixed grill. And if I can only digest 20 grams of it, where's that other protein? Is it just still sat in my gut? I don't think so. That's been mixed up with some really nice work from Dan Moore from Stu Phillips' lab that showed that in that study they were doing at the time using one-legged knee extensor exercise... 20 grams of protein gave the maximum muscle protein synthesis response in that situation. And I think that's been misinterpreted by a lot of people to say, you don't need more than 20 grams of protein in any one meal, you can't digest it, and any more is a waste. We've seen research since then. Kev Tipton, um, bless him, um, good friend of mine who obviously passed away this year, he, he did a, a remarkable uh, study that showed that 40 grams when you're doing whole body exercise, was better than 20 grams. So that 20 grams, I think, needs needs to die. It was a beautiful study on a proof of concept that in a given situation, there is a maximum anabolic response to protein. But in that situation, it was 20. That's not in every situation. And when I'm working, so that was with single leg exercise in about 80 kilo students. That Stu never intended that to be translated, but when I work with an England rugby player at 120 kilos doing whole body exercise, then onto the field and doing field work, 20 grams, I am I really going to start chopping a third off a chicken breast? Because you can only digest 20. So I think we can put that one to bed. Um, and, and I'll give you two <laughs> because I've got carried away with that one. Uh, and a second one, I think, is that the modern day endurance athlete is keto and low carb, you know, and I, I'd, I'd like to dismiss that one. Uh, I don't know any high performing elite athlete who's doing that. I do know a few that have days of low carbohydrate training to enhance mitochondrial biogenesis or to help with body composition. And, and I know a lot that use the concept of fuel for the work required, which, and use a traffic light system like I often do where I've got red, amber, green, red being low carb days, amber being normal and green being high. So I might have red low carb meals and I might have sessions in a low carb state. But when it comes to performance, I don't know any world class athlete in most sports. And I put that caveat most because you can throw at me ultra, ultra endurance running where you've got to jog slowly for three days. You could make an argument, but up to like marathon distance, rugby, football, carbohydrate is still king. Uh, and, and hopefully I'll finish my two, my two myths Happy with days. that statement. I think that brings, it, brings us to an end. I've, I've, I've fit in the hour. But one last thing before I let you go. There's obviously lots of work that you've got going on currently, but have done in the past. Where's the best place for people to find more about your work? Yeah, well, I'm always happy to speak to people, uh, interact on social media if I can help at, at all. So um, my, my Twitter handle is at close <laughs> underscore nutrition. It might be close <laughs> CBD soon, but let's go for close nutrition for now. Uh, Instagram, it's just at close nutrition. 
all one word. I am building a website at the moment, so it's not great, but it would be a good way to find out what I'm doing and find out about me. So it's under construction, so don't judge me too harshly on it at the moment. But that's just www.closenutrition.com. It's got all my contact details and that. Um, and then the Liverpool John Moores University website, it, it, it's easy to find my on, uh, get my email Brilliant. and contact details. Graham, thank Remember. you very much. Thank you for fitting me in the week after a nice little holiday, which I know is uh, is always a little bit manic getting back to all the emails and stuff and you've got plenty going on. So I really appreciate it. I'll let you go. Hang around, we'll have a little chat, but um, officially I'll let you go.